Hello, and welcome to the virtual worship service for the Fredonia Presbyterian Church. We are an open and affirming church with a mission focus. We are currently between pastors after the retirement of our beloved minister. I'm Rachel Spengler, our current clerk of session, and one of several people charged with helping us through this time of transition. I have just a few announcements before we get started with our service today. The first is that we have a commitment to accessibility, and that is why we have closed captioned our services. In case you're having trouble hearing anything, you can go to the spot just below the video on YouTube and click the CC button. That should provide captioning for you. The second announcement is that session met this week along with Reverend Rachel Brown of the Presbytery of New York, and we will be sharing a summary of that meeting in our upcoming newsletter. You will also receive a letter this week with more details, so please be on the lookout for both of those documents. The third announcement is that we have some new names on our prayer list. Barb and Dick Skinner our friends of Barb Lucarello. They live in a rehabilitation and long-term care facility in Ohio. That facility is now a site 
of an active outbreak of COVID-19. Both Barb and Dick have tested positive for the virus. Please keep them in your continued prayers in the weeks ahead. Lastly, we have been praying for Zachary Delaniak for quite a while now, and we received an update on his condition this week. While Zach still has a long way to go and some very big medical appointments coming up, he is showing some great improvements. And due to the blessings of video, I don't just get to tell you about them, I get to show them to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll see ya. Yeah. Where? Look. Yep, whose truck is that? It's in the road. It's in the driveway. And now, with that smile to start our service off right, please join with me in our opening sentences. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Now let us come together in our call to worship. In faith, Abraham and Sarah set out for a new land. In faith, we seek to follow God as we travel through life. In faith, the church seeks to discern the future with God who calls us in our age. In faith, we gather now to worship, seeking new life in Christ. God of present, past, and future, guide us now into your new age of promise. Let us welcome God into this moment and place and join in worship. If we say, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is just and loving, will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins, first in a silent prayer, and then in a unison prayer. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The love of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let the people say, amen. And now, I am honored to welcome Reverend, Reverend Drew Ludwig of the Presbytery of Western New York, who is going to talk to us today as part of our ongoing mission to address the racial inequalities in our society and in our faith. Our first reading is from Philippians chapter two. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Do not look out only for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself 
and obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our gospel reading today is from John chapter 8. No doubt many of you have heard this story before. Uh, as you listen this time, I invite you to pay attention to Jesus' posture uh, and his physical relationship in proximity to the woman in this story with him. As Jesus was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are, your, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. If you are like me and being safe at home, you've spent too much time on the internet, maybe you saw the same tweet that I saw uh, as protests and unrest traveled across the nation. A young woman who uh, I believe grew up in the church said, I was warned more about the dangers of spaghetti straps than the dangers of racism. And as we do on social media, I liked that and I retweeted that because that was in fact my experience. I mean, I don't wear a lot of spaghetti straps, but I heard that lesson that Women's clothing is something that has to be talked about and washed and can be dangerous. And yet, growing up, I did not have a sermon. I did not hear a sermon about the evil or dangers of racism, nor a Sunday school lesson, nor a youth group lesson. And obviously, I hope it's obvious, it's something that needs to be talked about. And yet I think that we don't talk about it in part because we are so uncomfortable, especially those of us that are seen as white or that think we are white. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to feel responsible for something that isn't ours. We don't we don't like talking about it because we don't have a lot of practice talking about it. So if we're going to be uncomfortable, let's start 
with the assumption that we're Presbyterians. And Presbyterians, week after week after week, at, in most churches, I assume it's the same in Hamburg, we've got a corporate confession where we pray a prayer of confession together, where we all admit that we don't have it figured out, that we screwed up, that we screw up again, and that we need forgiveness. And as we have that corporate confession, we can have that corporate confession because we rest in the knowledge of the grace of God. That Jesus loved us and loves us while we are still sinners. So if there's any people that ought to be able to admit that we've been wrong, if there's anyone that can go into a place of discomfort, well, hopefully it's us. That's disclaimer number one before we talk further. Disclaimer number two is um, I'm coming to you having learned a little bit, but not making any claim to have it all figured out. We are all, uh, especially us white people, as we engage this, we are going to make mistakes. We are going to get things wrong. We're going to say the wrong thing or think the wrong thing. Uh, and that's okay. It's better to try and make mistakes and learn and keep going than just be terrified and never try and never grow. Discla disclaimer number three, uh, before we even start, is uh, not only are we going to make some mistakes, uh, but I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Uh, we try to keep Presbyterian worship less than an hour, right? We could talk about this stuff for weeks. So I'm going to talk about some big stuff, uh, but we won't have it all. So those are the disclaimers. Why are we going into this un uncomfortable place where we don't know everything, where people are going to get mad just because we talk about it? Well, I'll be a good preacher. I'll give you three reasons for that. Uh, one, uh, living in fear, living in shame is miserable, right? If you have a secret, keeping that secret is hard. If you have a shame, keeping the secret is difficult. But once you let it out, you're free and it has no power over you. Secondly, um, racism doesn't only hurt people of color. It hurts all of us, it probably hurts you, it probably hurts someone you love. Because the violence that is required to maintain such a system, quite simply, it's expensive. Even if you don't care about people that are violently attacked, and I hope you do, but even if for some reason you're so heartless that you don't, just know that those people get to make settlements and those financial settlements, settlements are in the millions of dollars and they come out of your pocket as my, and my pocket. Again, let's not do the taxpayer argument, right? But if we're just going to that base level, there we are. Here's the reason more than anything that I want us to talk about this. I want us to talk about this because we've got the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. And as a follower of Jesus, I bear the name Christian. And you bear the name Christian. And I was raised that not taking the Lord's name in vain means don't say the word God or Jesus in the wrong way or disrespectful or don't say cuss words. But I think what it's really about is if you're going to take that name on yourself, you need to represent it. And so I don't think it's acceptable to bear the name of Jesus and not love the whole body of Christ, not love the whole community that Jesus loves not love justice that Jesus is making. So that's the why. But hopefully we all agree on the why. How is the tricky part? What are we supposed to do? 
Well, uh, there's a couple, there's a few different things we could do. Again, we could fill sermon after sermon after sermon with this, but I'm just going to give you four things, and three of them come right out of this story, and the fourth one I tacked on because it's important, uh, even if it's not in this story. Uh, but the first thing I want you to realize is that Jesus, when he was dealing with that woman that was caught in adultery, listened to her. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowd that brought him, brought her to him, they expected him to listen to them. They expected him to listen to the law of Moses, and he listened to them, and he listened to the law of Moses, and he was quiet for a bit. And I think in that quiet, just maybe... He was trying to tune in to that woman and her needs and her experience and her value and trying to tune in to the Holy Spirit and how he was called to respond in that moment. And I would suggest that if we're going to talk about race and racism, one of the very first things that we can do is start listening to some other voices. One of the first times that I was convicted about my own racism was in a conversation and someone said, oh yeah, there's lots of racism in the world. You were probably raised in a system. And I said, what? No, like I'm surrounded by good people. I'm, I, I wasn't taught racism. And they said, well, sure, but like, all of your education has been, been white people. And I said, I'm sure not all of my education was white people. And they said, well, what's the last book written by a person of color that you read? And at that point, I was in college. A, a fancy liberal arts college, no less. And, and now, like looking back, I remember there was a freshman seminar where we read Langston Hughes. But I couldn't remember Langston Hughes at that time. And I'm a decent reader. I went through the list. And I was like, wow. I read a whole lot of white men. And... Full disclosure, in case you're not seeing the video, I'm a white man. Like, I've got nothing against white men in general. If I ever write a book, I hope you'll read it. But there's a lot of other voices out there. And if we're not listening to those voices, what are we hearing? C.S. Lewis, his rule for himself was, for every new book he reads, he reads an old book. And he did that to just compensate for the bias that comes with time, right? We want to read old literature, we want to read new literature. So he went 50-50, he alternated. If, if we did that with white writers and with people of color, we'd probably still read way too many white people. But I wonder what else we'd hear I wonder what else we'd learn. It's not that difficult for us, especially in this age of social media and, and all of the resources that we have for us to listen to some different voices. The other thing that Jesus did that I'm gonna recommend that, that we do is when he was asked a question about the law He didn't respond with just the law. What would happen if whenever there was an issue, a problem, a controversy, if instead of asking what's legal, we asked what's right? Because what's legal and what's right are not always the same thing, right? The scripture verse that I was taught to memorize as a child 
Romans 12, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There are patterns in this world that get repeated again and again and again and again, and we're not called to conform to those patterns, right? Well, the people that are conforming to those patterns, that are making those patterns, those, those are the people that make our laws, that make our educational system, that make the broader culture, media, entertainment, so there are patterns out there. And yes, they're in the law too. So asking what's legal is not always gonna show us what's right. There's that very popular reminder that the people that hid and Frank were breaking the law. And the people that sought to find her and take her were following the law. What's legal and what's right. Let's not ask what's legal. Let's ask what's right. The third thing that I saw Jesus do in this story. The woman is brought before him. It sounds like she's dragged before him, right? And there's the, the crowd around her and him. And the first thing that he does is stoops down in the dirt, right? And I imagine, and it doesn't say this explicitly, it doesn't say it isn't, but if she's dragged there, I think that maybe she's brought low. And I've heard a bunch of sermons on, on this story before. A lot of people say, oh, well, I wonder what he was writing in the dirt, right? Maybe he was writing the sins of all the other people that were watching. Maybe he was writing the scriptures that would correct them, right? We don't know what he was writing. Maybe he was just playing with his fingers in the dirt because what he really needed to do was put himself on the same level this accused woman. And he would stand up again to talk to the crowd, take that authority that comes with standing, but again, go back to her and stay with her. And in that posture, what I see is humility, right? not considering himself better than others, but humbling himself, putting himself on the same level as the accused, getting down in the dirt with her. That's humility, godly humility. But also courage. Because they came wanting to stone her. And Jesus, with this accused woman, who everyone wants to stone, gets right next to her so that his face is near her face. His body is near her body. And I think a big part of that is, you don't get to just stone one person today. If you're gonna stone her, you're gonna stone me. What Jesus did with this woman whose life was at risk was he used his voice and he used his body to protect her from an angry mom who wanted to do violence to her. If we listen to different voices, and hear them. If we determine that what, what is right might be different than what is legal, maybe the next step is for us to say something. Maybe the next step is for us to use who we are, our bodies, 
protect people. The fourth thing that isn't quite in this story, but it's frankly all throughout scripture, is I'm gonna invite you as you confront racism in your own life, in your own town, in this world, and in, in your church, to do it with a group of people. When you read in Acts about the explosive growth of the church, it's because there was a community where there was no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. That different kind of community where cultural barriers were broken down caused awe. It changed people. We confront racism as a community because we have more power when we work together because we're going to screw up and uh, we need to correct one another and bring people along and, and lift one another. We do it because we're going to get tired and we need support and prayer. Ultimately, the question of racism when it comes to Christians is who are your people? And once my people were Ludwigs, my people were Germans, my people were white people or men or Americans or whatever. And in Christ, all of those identities get subsumed. When I go into the waters of baptism, I am made one with all who are called into those waters. Ultimately, the why of why we confront racism is because it is our sibling. It is our family that is the victim of racism. So, family in Christ, your invitation, listen to different voices. Ask yourself what is right instead of asking what's legal. In humility, Use your voice, use your body, and then act with those that God has given you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Reverend Ludwig, for that insightful and enlightening message. And now, let us join together in our hymn, In Christ There Is No East and West. You can follow along with the words on your screen. with me in our affirmation of faith. In life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now 
Let us bow our heads for a time of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness to your people. We are so blessed to be created in your image and that we ask you to help us to see the same in every person. We know that every individual is precious in your sight and we ask you for your forgiveness for the times when we have failed to act in accordance with that knowledge. Help us to be filled with your love, with a passion for your people, with hearts for justice, and voices used in fervent service of your gospel. Lord, be with all of those in our own community and out in the world who are fighting for acceptance, fighting for equality, Guide them in their endeavors and help us to support them in every way we can. Please lean on the hearts of our leaders. Open their eyes and their ears and their minds to the cries of the people they serve, all of them, not just the rich and the powerful or the comfortable. Lord, please be with all of those who are charged with caring for others right now, healthcare workers, teachers, our scientists, our essential workers. Help us to become a culture of caring, one that supports those who bears the greatest burden of responsibility. Let us each strive to set aside our own desires and whims so that we may better serve the most vulnerable. Lord, we pray for all of those who are sick, who are living in poverty, who are living under the threat of violence. We pray for the hungry, the lonely, the immigrant, the refugee, and all of those who suffer. We pray for those who do not know your love or who have been made to feel like they don't deserve it. We pray for those whose needs we don't know and even those whose names we don't know because we know, Lord, that we are all connected. We pray especially for the members of this church family and those in need close to our congregation. We lift up their names now, Lord. Lori Fabritis, Richard Staborski, Rena Finko, Janet Gerkensmeyer, Greg Furman, Greg Muller, Gina Waite Platt, Donna Heintzman, Dick Ackley, Josiah Robinette, Tim Brackett, Rachel H., Michelle Patterson, Hazel Crockless, Kim Risco, Zachary Delaniak, Travis Klaus, May Lai, Amy Calm, Milo Willie, Dick Watt, Caleb Kaus, Joy Height, the Reverend Early Waller, Judy Sumption, Charles Devine, Tom Withington, Lorraine Withington, and Barb and Dick Skinner. Lord, we also lift up the Tapaza Center for Orphans of the Church of Jesus Christ in Madagascar as well as the Presbyterian Education Board in Pakistan. God, we lay these prayers at your feet, confident that you have already heard them. We trust in your love and mercy as we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, friends, this is the part of our service where we traditionally take up an offering of tithes and tokens to show our appreciation for all the blessings that God has given us. If you are able and so moved, we are still accepting those gifts, which can be mailed to the church to help us continue to do God's work in our community. We remain ever grateful for everyone who has been able to remain faithful to their pledges during these turbulent times. However, we are also aware that many among us find themselves in uncertain situations. If you are unable to give financially right now, please know that we understand and we think that God does too. So with that in mind, we hope that you will use this time to reflect on the ways that you can show your gratitude to God for all of the blessings in your life. join with me in our unison prayer of thanks. Gracious God, we thank you for the measure of faith you have given to each of us. Increase in us generosity, compassion, and prophetic courage so we may be continue to be your body in and for the world. With thanksgiving, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. And now, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, repay no one evil for evil, but do good to one another. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and find reason to give thanks in all circumstances. May God the Creator watch over you. May Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, walk by your side and show you the way. And may the Holy Spirit dwell in your heart and bring you peace. Amen.